one thing on your rules that just, the other thing I, I I really disagreed with was the management. I really you appreciate that you right. disagree with it. That's first of all, that's a good thing. You know, yeah. that's great. No, no. But, uh, I mean, uh, I, look, there's no right way of doing investing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the beauty. It's the, the marvelous thing about it is that everybody does it in their own way. Everybody's very, very different, and you can make money in all sorts of ways. But if you don't talk to management, how do you know that you can trust them? It was a very dumb thing that I wrote in the book. And uh, I'm eight years on from it. And uh, if I was to write a new edition, uh, that is something. In fact, I, I would say that one of the, I, there's very little that pains me about having written the book. And I'm proud of it. And I'm delighted that it's had an impact. Uh, but it pains me that some people will read that and think that that's what Guy Spear thinks today. And, and not only is it not what I think today, I think that I've had some enormous losses because I applied that rule. And I think that I can go back and I can do it now a little bit. And maybe if I, we do a second edition, I can kind of think about it in more depth. Um, what was it that led me to such a clearly wrong conclusion? I mean, I, I, I you know, I'm happy. You know, there may be some things that you vehemently disagree with. I mean, checking the stock price, I think we're in different places there. But um, and the, the analogy that I've used is that I think that Part of my fear of talking to management is that I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm uh, hyper aware of my capacity to be duped, say, of to be to be taken in by a nice story. But you know that's similar to saying that a chainsaw can cause enormous injury. But if you need to cut down a few trees, what are you going to do? Take out a penknife? Of course, you've got to take out the chainsaw. And you damn well better learn how to use it well and safely. And so. It is, it is it, talking to management is fraught with opportunities for getting the wrong end of the stick, being duped by the story, being misled, being pointed in a direction where they don't want you, where they want you to look, but not, it, they may be duping themselves. It may be, not be nefarious. They may just themselves not want to look in a particular place. And so they kind of reinforce something. But the fact of the matter is, it, the management team is a nexus of enormous amounts of knowledge and insight at the, about the company, and you would be absolutely nuts not to talk to them. And I also think that it's when I'm. It's much easier to read a book in French or to learn French when you're in France. Can you intend to learn French sitting here in London or somewhere else? Yes, but you'll do. You'll be far more efficient in France. Maybe all I do is visit. I mean, just to take a probably a trite way of looking at it, but. You know, if if maybe I go to Atlanta and all I do is walk around outside the headquarters of Coca-Cola because for one reason or another I can't get inside, but that's going to stimulate me to think more clearly about Coca-Cola, say, than if I'm not in Atlanta. So I think that just going and kicking the tires in one way or another, the story that I tell about this one bankruptcy that was in my portfolio is that I believe that if I'd have gone and visited the plant and just talked to people outside, I would have it's far more likely that I would have come to the decision that this was not something that was right for my portfolio. So so you, you're jumping through an open door. And um, I think it's really, you know, um, we when we when when we grow and learn, we change our opinions. And so changing one's opinion is a good thing. And yeah, I, I don't know what idiot would write that in a book on investing. And uh, and I fundamentally disagree with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. quite funny, and I know credit to you for for changing your mind. I mean, I I think that you know, because what I was going to say is that, I mean, when you first go and invest, just the you can first of all you can learn quite a lot from the management, and you the way they think about their yeah. own business yeah. can tell you a lot because they they know more about it than you do. Yeah. But when you want to own shares for a long time, the having a constant dialogue when I say constant but you know meeting the management every year yeah and checking that what they said last year has come true yeah and checking that they aren't changing their story yeah because if you're going to own a stock and you know I've owned stocks for m multiple years I mean I worked for hedge funds but yeah. they were very fundamentally driven hedge funds and we didn't have any reason why we wouldn't own a stock for five years yeah and if you're going to own a stock for five years, you know, at some point, 
it's quite likely that you will want to sell that stock because there's another opportunity yeah. or because the, the, the results aren't coming through. But you might also want to sell the stock because you think the strategy is drifting yeah. or you think that there's, there's something that you don't feel comfortable about. And I think that checking in with the management, yes. how's it going? And of course, the longer you own the stock, the closer you'll come to the become with yeah. the management and they'll trust you and you can also have an influence on the way the business is, is run. Yeah. You, can, you can mention the ideas that you've got and so you're actually get, being a positive influence but the feedback I think is, is, is in, and enormously important. It is and I think that one thing that I would add to that is that and for the benefit of anybody who's uh, new to this is make make and it's easiest to talk about this in American companies where I understand the reporting cycles the best, is that remember that the press release is considered to be informal statements that were mentioned at a conference talking. The, the standard of reporting that comes through in a 10K, which is prepared, or a, a, a 10Q, which is prepared by lawyers and accountants, and the statements made in the, in the 10K and the Q and in the in the in the in the, um, uh, in the financial statements have to be far more carefully looked at, and so not only what the management as team is saying from year to year, but what are they saying relative to what's in the statements and what's being left out? And I, I think that just this idea of collecting, understanding things in the right order, look for the written, look for those authoritative documents first before you go to the non-authoritative documents. Often there, there are significant differences between what the press release says and what the um, 10K or Q says because of those different standards. And you get a sense of where the management is kind of pushing. And then when you take that into account with that background, now you ask the management questions or you see how they respond to questions on conference calls. You can get a sense of whether they're dealing with reality or not, whether they're kind of trying to puff things up or whether they're trying to take things down. And so... You're absolutely right. And um, I think that my bias there is that my the, the, the sort of the module in my brain that evaluates people is really not that good in comparison to others. So I have a deep seated desire to want to shy away from it. But in this particular and I think that it's good to focus on the things that you're good at and to leave other things to people, other people who may be good at those things. In this case, it's something where I actually have to make a little bit more effort. I don't like writing as much as I like doing numbers, but I have to make a little bit more effort if I want to communicate well. This is something where I... Sometimes you can focus on your strength and sometimes you have to say, well, this is something that even though I'm not that good at it, I need it. <laughs> well, I mean, just because you're not good at it doesn't mean to say that you can't do... You know, that you should ignore it. Yes, I mean, correct. you might not be as good as somebody else. But yeah. you can, it's, And it's a skill you can develop. I mean, you meet enough managers and get lied to often enough, then... You know, you can remember the guy yeah. who lied to you. And and it's it's also a fascinating thing that I think is maybe true of life, but it's certainly true in financial markets, is that if you ignore your weakness, it's it, it might come and clobber you when you're not looking. But if you say, this is something that I'm not very good at, it is a weakness for me, then, then in a way it can become a strength because because now you're allowing for it and and this pattern seems to emerge time and time again in investing um and you can also train i mean I, i'm i'm still a bit um irritated because covid came and interrupted the the development of we did we were developing a new product so i'd found this guy who trains policemen in interrogating suspects and so he's brilliant at body language yeah and i i agreed with them that we would do a course for investors yeah so in fact one of my invest one of my investor clients had said to me oh you know do you know anybody could you do could you do as this course now I, I found this guy just by accident and um i thought brilliant this is going to be and i thought it'd be really fun for me as well right? yeah that we do this course about how do you interview a manager and how do you tell you know how do you phrase the questions how do you tell if he's lying and um Unfortunately, the guy had his, his personal circumstances changed during COVID, and we now can't do that course. So I'm looking for the, the the right person to replace him. And we do we we do a little bit of this in my forensic accounting course. But we do a bit about the psychological makeup of people that lie, right? And, and managers that lie. And so right. how do you 
how do you um, work that out? And, you know, what sort of questions do you ask? Because people aren't very good at asking questions. But we're, we've got to two of your eight rules, so you'll need yeah. to come back. But the, <laughs> the, the closing question we always ask everybody is, is there a book or a practice that you would recommend to a young person thinking of becoming an analyst or an in investor? Yeah, so um, so I've had some time to prepare from that. And before I get into that, I just it's just come up for me and I just want to share it. You'll get a preview of some of what Steve and I will talk about, uh, hopefully at a, at, a, at a really enjoyable lunch because I haven't spent nearly enough time talking to Steve and I, I'm looking forward to doing it offline as well. But I met a guy who's a former intelligence officer and uh, he was just meeting me in my office and I kind of had asked him a similar question. I'd kind of said, look, I think that what you do in your world has huge implications for investors and we haven't really start to kind of investigate that. And there are no real books that I can read. So he, um, he'd read my book and he says, oh yeah, and I love the fact that you wrote about meeting Warren Buffett and talking about your car. It was a Ferrari, wasn't it? And I kind of jumped on him and said, Porsche. Correct. And he said, he, and, and he said, aha, you see, that's, that's, that's where we start trying to figure people out. So I deliberately introduced that mistruth. And I wanted to see how you reacted to it. Did you accept it? Or did you let it go by? And, uh, and th th that's just like, sort of, um, uh, it's a fascinating idea in meeting with the management team to introduce something that flatters their business and see if they correct it or not. You know, and see, well, that tells you something. <laughs> and I didn't realize there's a kind of a proactive way in which they do it. So it's kind of like, I, I think that some of the most brilliantly psychologic genius people are in that world. And I think you're absolutely right to try and figure out what can apply to investing. And so, um, you know, happy to share that person's name with you. And maybe we can collaborate on that. But um, so in terms of books, I, I, I think that what I, I you know, William Green collaborated with me on my book. I don't want to appear on your podcast without having talked about William Green's book. It's an absolutely wonderful book, which takes you through the minds of some of the greatest investors around today. And William spent enormous amounts of time with them. You've interviewed him. So uh, I, I wanted to mention that. But then I just wanted to give a facetious answer, which I think is actually really helpful. And so the, the answer is, which book would particularly help a, a, somebody who's getting into this? And the answer is all of them. And my point to the listener is, in the same way that we've had, we, we talked a little bit about how seeing somebody's investment moves without seeing the full psychological picture and without seeing the full balance sheet is not really particularly helpful, potentially, it can be misleading. I would say that what's more important is not what I say is a great book, uh, but that you should go to the library and start pulling out 20, 30 books and start figuring out what is the right book for you in that moment. And when I say all of them, if you have an intent to make progress, your job is to get as many candidate books as possible. Unfortunately, you can't read them all in parallel and try and figure out through a process of rapid elimination what is right for you to read right now and develop in a certain way your own reading program and realize that even if uh, a book is going to be really, really good for you, it might not be the first book that you should read. And so I think that the best learners and the best readers through their experience of reading something develop an intuitive sense of what if it's right for them right now. And if it is right for them, they'll continue to read. But it may be that what you want to do is dip and then put it aside and go to something else. And I think that that capacity to kind of like decide what your diet will be and feed yourself that diet and update your knowledge of what that meta knowledge of what the diet is and where to go is super, super important. And um, realize that, so what, what I recommend is not going to be the most important thing. And I think that a lot of the time people in my shoes in a conversation like this will want to recommend something that is recognized as being a good recommendation, but may not actually end up being the best recommendation for you. As Steve told me, there's a wonderful, I really enjoyed, so short story about William Green. So William Green wrote Which Are Wiser Happier. He also collaborated with me on my book in which I had a finished manuscript, which was pretty crappy. It would have passed muster with the publisher. 
And then William and I went through a project which took about three or four months of rewriting most of it and making it way, way, way better. But there were many moments when what William had to do after having worked through the existing text and interviewed me was rewrite it. And he would go away and rewrite it and he would go gray. And he had to do that. And, uh, and I'd say I'd be sort of like wandering around upstairs and you know, this this baby of mine is now in his hands, in extremely, extremely good hands. I'd be like, well, what am I supposed to do? And I tried my hand once at editing his writing, which was a totally disastrous thing to do. So William would say to me derisively, he'd say, well, why do you just work on the bibliography? <laughs> so <laughs> there I am upstairs in uh, Zurich working feverishly on the bibliography while William is creating chapters of great beauty out of my original writing. And, um, and so the bibliography is worth looking at. And, and, and you know, um, maybe another way of answering the question, I hope you're okay with me being so discursive, such a long answer to such a simple question, I could have just given a, a book, is um, something that my daughter asked me. So my daughter's currently learning Italian in Rome and she's trying to pick electives for her first year of university, and she has to do a language. She's wondering if she should do a language with, that she already knows, or they should do a new language that she doesn't know. So like the options like Sanskrit, Japanese, uh, Russian. And I strongly urged her. I kind of said, look, it all depends on the teacher, who else is in the class, all of those good things. But I just think building the broadest base possible. Uh, so, you know, I urged her, she, I, kind of, Sanskrit sounds like fun to me. I mean, I told her the more she progresses in life, the less like she is to do these kind of random big jumps. And so, you know, my urge to the reader is, you know, approach a text, not saying is this something that some authority has told me is a good text to read, is what can I learn from this text that is going to help me? Maybe you're going to come across something that none of the other people have. And, and that's kind of fun and interesting. And, and, I, have, I think that that applies to literature as well. Tyler Cohn has written a, a fascinating thing where he said, um, uh, you know, literature is an interesting laboratory for economists. So uh, when, when authors, great authors have written really interesting stories, there may be interesting lessons that one can learn. And so I, 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 you know, I would not restrict it to fiction and just develop that sixth sense of whether this thing is right for you right now.